I think I have everybody who will be presenting today online. So good morning everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful summer vacation. Um, so just to remind everyone, the the meeting is recorded, so just be aware of that and be careful with what you say. <laughs> um, so with regards to the agenda today, um, again, I'm just going to have a brief introduction to the team and highlight a few items for updates, um, throw out a few provocative questions to the team and solicit feedback. Um, we're going to get some cell-based assay updates from um, Alex and Zhang Fu. Um, they have done some nice um, combination analysis and so they'll give us an update on some, some of those studies. Um, Chris Jones and Deanna Martin, they have done some cell-based work also, but Deanna couldn't be here, so she decided she'll present that work at the next meeting. But I couldn't resist, I steal one of her slides and I'm going to actually show you kind of a high level, some of her data. Um, she'll provide some of that detail for the assays and stuff when she presents next month. Um, Sue is going to give us an update on some of her backup chemistry efforts. And then I'm going to open the floor to any burning questions, items to discuss. Right. Okay, so again, I thought I'll start off with some of the action levels and kind of get a good sense of where we are in terms of accomplishing some of these. So one of the key action levels that's being ongoing, we were delayed, was to complete that second dose of um, 2009 in the FOP model. Um, for Mylene. I think at the last meeting, you know, she ended up having to kind of repeat the study, and so we haven't heard from her since. So, you know, just stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll get some of that data analyzed and get an update on that. Um, <clears throat> next is the evaluation of some alto inhibitors with other mechanisms of action. Um, so, that study is now complete. And this complements nicely what um, Alex and John is going to present today. Um, Jerome did uh, some of this work. He couldn't be here today, so he's going to present a lot of that work at the next meeting. But it's all done. It's all done. It's just the analysis to be done, and I'll let Jerome do the presentation for that one next day. Um, another key thing that we keep looking at during the project is to kind of get comfortable with established drivers in some of these patient-derived DIPG lines and to figure out if any of these are really out to driven. Um, so some of that work is still ongoing. We are considering using project approach, and we continue to use some of the selective compounds and put them on the line to identify. Um, and so, as I, as I said earlier, I'm going to present some of Diana's work. You could see she's testing a couple of our compounds in a host of lines, and some of that data is looking very interesting. So, um, the efficacy model, again, very key to accomplishing um, one of the key milestones in this week's goals. So, um, Angle should have started by now the, the DIPG study. He had mapped out a plan and showed us the way he was going to do the experiment. So, that should have been started by now. And also, we got a nice plan from Chris Jones. They're going to look at the Belcher model. Mm -hmm. And so we have 10 compounds, they have everything in place, and so that should get started soon. So hopefully, and as I said, these studies are, you know, long-term studies, so in about, what, a month, two months, we should be hopefully getting some of that data close to the end of the, the timeline for the CTIP program. Okay, um, in addition, last meeting, we actually identified, you know, four interesting candidates we wanted to look at a bit closer. Um, so we decided to get them scaled up to 50 grams, just a request it. So that has been initiated, so hopefully we'll have enough compounds to do all of the subsequent um, preclinical and GLP evaluation for some of those. Um, we also decided to start looking at PK in other species, so we took the four compounds, we evaluated them in that PK. I'm going to give you some of that update today. We also did some dose escalation studies in most just to get a better sense that you know we'll be able to do proper toxicology studies during the clinical development. Um, and also with regards to some of the backup compounds, um, we evaluated selected compounds on the backup series from Sue's effort. And so 
Um, Sue is going to give the update for those. I didn't put those in some of my background presentation, so you'll get a chance to see how those compounds are looking. Okay. Um, again, I like to remind people the disease areas that an ALK2 inhibitor <laughs> might be involved in, but our focus is on DIPG, a real area of unmet need. It's no good treatment, so I know the gas is a small molecule for that. But all in all, you're going to see if we come up with nice, safe candidates, I mean, FOP, which is basically a causal, ALK2 is a causal mechanism. All is not lost. I mean, some of our candidates can still be utilized in disease areas like FOP if they're well tolerated. So that's something people should also continue. The effort doesn't go to zero if you don't see anything, you know, hugely in some of the preclinical efficacy models. So there is a lot of potential for some of the candidates to develop it. Um, again, I wanted to remind people again, so these were the four candidates we selected, and this is a snapshot of the overall profile you know, against the overall target product profile. And you could say, I mean, you know, 2117 looks quite decent, 209 also looks very good. Those have more impressive um, CNS penetration profile. But like I say, we were kind of playing with the kind of herd activity, which I think, now I think about it more, that may not be so much of an issue, but I'm going to put some questions out on the table for us to discuss today. Um, the good thing is we have identified through chemistry SAR are ways to mitigate this herb liability, but it's not without a cost. We actually pay a cost in CNS penetration for some of the compounds you could see. And that's not surprising. Um, the AMI that we introduced on the triphenyl methoxy side, I mean, that mitigates the herb by being a little bit more polar, but it's also you know, creates problem of efficiency and its penetration. So in optimization, we always have to strike that delicate balance. And so we decided to take a risk and those two AMI compounds just to evaluate them more and see what we see. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is, um, you know, these compounds that get into the brain probably about 15 to 20%. I mean, something like sumatriptan, which is used to treat headache, the BBB penetration for that is 14%. I mean, it does work. I mean, people sometimes question whether or not that penetration is actually enough. We are in a new disease area in the brain. I think one of the things we have probably going against us is probably um, the disease which is in the pun. Apparently, apparently, I learned from Christine Hawkins and stuff that the pun's BBB is tighter than the general BBB. So, you know, if you're compromised for BBB penetration to the whole brain, it might even be worse in the ponds getting to the target area. So those are things to keep in mind. But at least we have covered the gamut. We have compounds that are very, very penetrant. And I think we'll be able to get to the target. Okay, um, with regards to some of the updates with these fully compounds that we selected, um, so we got back the full data for the dose escalation from the period in series. And so what I've tried to do is just summarize here what the four doses that we did, 10 mix, 25 mix, 50, and 100 mix in mouse, and all of the compounds show very, very nice linear dose escalation. You know, so we're quite comforted by that. We're quite happy to see that not only 209 show that property, but all of the compounds that we picked had very, very good properties in terms of, you know, as we increase the dose, we see increase in exposure. And that's always good because when you start doing toxicity, that's the kind of profile you need to see as you start upping the dose. Uh, you have AUC over uh, the dose yeah. as the, I think that's in there because you suspect that might be the efficacy ratio? No, it's kind of something you use to look at linearity. If all is ideal, the dose over the AUC should be a nice clean line. Yeah. But sometimes, I mean, because as I say, PK sometimes can be variable from animal to animal. So you either want a straight line for that number or you kind of want it. You want to know that as you push the dose, you're actually getting an um, a corresponding increase in exposure in order to make any meaningful call from toxicology studies. And so you either want it to be a straight line or hopefully it's actually going up. You know, so it's just a kind of a parameter we use to assess linearity. Okay. So the theoretical... Okay, so you just have that to show the, the uh, linearity of the dosage. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the key is like, I mean, the key thing is with the same axe you could see as you increase the dose, you could see the same axe going up, and so that's what you want to see. Yeah, as you push through those. 
Okay, so I was comforted by the fact that all of the compounds had decent, you know, linear exposure with those. So that wasn't an issue. And then what we did in this study, we took the 100 mg dose and we decided to wait at a time point which we feel like is a little bit more steady state. So usually sometimes when you dose, initially, you know, some compound will give you this rapid burst and then some compound, depending on the dosing, you know, that early time point can actually fluctuate quite a bit. So we decided to wait for four hours when it's a little bit more steady state. When you've got that kind of plasma concentration, we have to question how much of it partitions into the brain. And so we picked the four hour time point for the 100 mg dose during this study, and here's the summary for the data. So you could see, so 2009 from that study that we had done, we see about almost a ratio of one. I've also included here the actual absolute concentration of the compound in the brain, so that's important. Because if you think about it, I mean, for some of the compounds that actually aren't as highly brain penetrant, it would be good to know what absolute concentration you have and whether that concentration is well above the IC50, you know, of your target. That's one. The other thing why I also think it's important to have efficient brain penetration. If the ratio is very low, which means that you have to be at a very high plasma dose in order to get meaningful concentration in the brain, but that puts you at toxicity risk. So, you know, the compounds that don't penetrate efficiently, you then have to have these whopping exposures in plasma even to get enough in the brain. So that's one of the caveats with having compounds that don't efficiently penetrate. So let's keep that in mind. But all in all, again, 2009 and 117 is very fantastic. You could see at 100 mg, you're seeing almost over 100 micromolar of the compound in the brain. That, that's amazing. So, and the animals are happy. And they, they haven't fallen out, so <laughs> that's, that's actually great. So, yeah, this is fantastic. I mean, you can't complain. I mean, so about some compounds, you know, you can't go past a microphone, all of the animals get wiped out. So this is quite comforting that the compound seems to be well tolerated from the PK studies. We still have to do proper tolerability, dose them for a couple of days and see how they're going to actually handle that dose. But we already have evidence from the FOP model, like 209, we can dose 209 for two weeks at 100 mg per kg and the animals were okay. That's the dose that we have, we have picked for the efficacy studies in DIPG. Those studies are going to go on for more than a month. So again, we'll get a good feel for the talks over time. All right. So, so, so all in all, we think 209 and 117 from the period in series. I think a very, very good brain penetration. Um, the AMIs, which are heard free, as I said, they are on the lower end, so I mean, and that might be a risk we might be willing to take for one of them just to see, you know, with that level of brain penetration, can you see any meaningful efficacy? Okay, the other point I also wanted to make, the fact that we were getting such good linear exposure with dose, peripherally, which means, like as I said, disease like FOP is not out of the question. So if these are efficient enough for the BBB penetration, I think there are still good compounds, well-tolerated compounds for FOP. So a lot of the L compounds that we've known before, a lot of them weren't really well-tolerated. I mean, a lot of the animal studies had to be done at like 25 mix per kg. You go beyond that and you start to see on towards side effects. So, so I think some of these compounds are really good in terms of their properties. Okay, the other thing we did, we did some um, rat PK, and I actually also included the previous mouse PK data so people can get a good sense. Um, we wanted to know if we were still getting good oral bioavailability in rat, and I could tell you, yes, I'm quite happy we are seeing good oral exposure. I mean, usually for oral exposure, anything, you know, above 20, 30% oral bioavailability is quite acceptable and decent. And so it's good to see, um, so 2009 was great, get almost 96% bioavailability. But more important is what kind of concentrations are we getting? So for 10 mg, oops, it's coming off at the bottom. So the IV dose was 2 mg. Okay, you can see it, it's at the bottom, cut off. But the um, oral dose was 10 mg per kg. And so for those doses, we're getting, you know, for the top two compounds that have such good penetration, we're getting just above a micromole exposure anyway. Anyway. That's still quite decent. Um, and then the other two compounds, we're seeing about 0.8. So but bottom line is we're still getting decent exposure, clearance. The clearance for the two bottom compounds is kind of moderate. But the top two compounds are quite decent. You can see 9 for 2117 and 30 for mouse and maybe 15 and 22, so those are still quite decent. The half-lives are still reasonable in rodents. So, 
So I'm quite happy that at least we are seeing you know, exposure across the other rodent species. The next step is to get you know, non-rodent PK. That's another preclinical IND enabling piece of data that we're going to need is either dog or monkey. And so I guess those might be left for later when mm -hmm. Owen gets a lot more cash. Or we could take the risk and get some dog data soon. All right, so any questions so far about the PK dose excavation? <laughs> if not, um, I'm going to go into some of the efforts in the IPG inhibition. This was again one of the Achilles here in the program, only focusing on FOP as a model, but as we spoke to a lot of the clinicians, there's quite a diverse of opinions, and, and more and more, it's like some of these groups that have these, um, what do you call them, the peanut those kind of um, consortiums, oh. they were insisting that, you know, you have to share some preclinical information mm -hmm. in a DIPD cell line. So we thought we could get away with, forget DIPD lines, it looked like some of these physicians, you know, they're kind of hardening the requirements to actually get into DIPD channels. So we have no, I think our compounds are going to work. So we have the compounds, they're ready, they look like they're well tolerated. tolerated. So we continue to evaluate them in some of these patient derived DIPG lines, okay? Um, and this is one of the data set from Deanna, kind of, uh, Deanna and Chris Jones. I had them to the bottom, but the name got cut off at the bottom of the slides. But this is some data we just got from Deanna. We had sent them 2009 and 2163, one of the early compounds that we had. And they had evaluated them across a number of patient derived DIPG lines. There is wild type and then there is a mutant. And she kind of annotated nicely a lot of the um, histone mutations that come with these cell lines. And then the difference between what she did, one of the differences between what she did and what we typically do with junk for you know, proliferation was related to basically cell density. She used a higher density in her studies. She used between like over a thousand to almost six thousand cells per hour. Um, we was um, Jean Fu actually went from about five hundred to a thousand. So you could see um, the data that we've gotten from Jean for, for 209, there might be a two to three fold shift because of the higher density. But nonetheless, as I think the compounds are working. I'm gonna let her give you the details update of the assay, what she did and stuff and some of the IC50 curves that I'll see. She's gonna show those at the next meeting. But the point I wanted to make, we continue to see a trend. So 2009, is, as she summarizes, is active across a lot of the mutant line. You're getting an IC50 of about what, a micromolar, 800 to a micromolar, kind of similar to what we saw with um, Angel. Um, however, the 2163, that compound, the fluorinated version of that compound, continued to be much more potent than 2009. Okay, and you know, so she was quite excited to see that level of potency. We said that's a hard to ask you still in the other question, but that particular compound is active across a number of patient-derived lines, so you know, we might have to keep an open mind for that candidate. I'll come back to that question mm -hmm. again. Um, I think in the corner here, she had a star. A lot of these um, proliferation studies that she did, she did them as 2D, in the, but apparently the, that particular line off to the side is called ICRCX. That probably only proliferate in 3D, so that study she had to do in, in, in 3D. Okay, so, and then I'll let her explain a lot of that detail at the next meeting. But all in all, the compounds were a lot more sensitive in the mutant line than they were in the wild type, so that's also interesting. Because since if you're going to be looking at patients that carry the mutation in the clinic, yeah. Um, so with Diana's data, I thought, let me just go and pull up some of the data that we had from Jean Fru and then compare, just to kind of remind people for the lead candidates, you could see the two lines that were showing very, very strong sensitivity is the IPG21 and 07, and then I added in orange the, 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 um, the 2163 compound, which is very active. So those are the properties that that compound had across the two lines. Okay, so we are, we are getting anti-proliferative effect in the mutants. I think, method, it's a good idea that 
we as a group, especially the, the trainees, mm -hmm. realize that you cannot measure an IC50 to three significant digits. Yeah. It's probably wise, I know that's what Excel spreads out or mm -hmm. your program spit out. Mm -hmm. It's probably wise to use one digit and plus or minus, mm -hmm. especially when you're trying to look at differences of twofold and get excited about it, mm -hmm. which you probably shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it, you see it happen because the program spit it out. Mm -hmm. Biochemists my age have a heart attack every time I see one of these slides because it is literally impossible to measure anything, mm -hmm. right, like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, really, really good habit to use one significant digit, mm -hmm. whatever the experimental uh, protocol allows, mm -hmm. and if possible, put error bars, at least to give us a range of what the measurements are, mm -hmm. right? Because it, it's really bad scientific practice to do what we're doing, mm -hmm. especially that it's on the internet for the world to see, mm -hmm. okay? So especially trainees, remember, old farts like me freak out when we see all those digits, because it's just wrong, okay? All right, so that. So what I did, I took the lead compounds and again, start com contextualizing the whole profile with some of the efficacy that we are likely to see in some of the cell lines and then some of the features that we, we desire in the compound. And so we need compounds that are potent at out to, that's highly brain penetrant, and at least have a reasonable herb profile. And so. The way a lot of the data is shaping up for the lead compounds is that 2009, 2117, those are highly brain penetrant, but they have this plaguing herd activity of 8 to 5 micromolar that in the beginning of the program everybody was freaking out. And so we need to get better herd compounds. Now we have better herd compounds, we have compromised the BBB penetration. So I've started thinking a lot about this and I'm starting to come to the conclusion that now to design compounds that give you all exposure and get into the brain is not always trivial. I mean, I come from a CNS job discovery background where we used to make a lot of CNS penetrant compounds. And so for oncology, a lot of cancer drugs usually don't get into the brain. And for the few that do, I mean, they tend to have nice physical properties. So we are now going after a task where we want compounds to get into the brain, and to preserve all of those optimal profiles that we look for, and it's a tall order. So now, this is a nice spectrum of some of the challenges anybody who is doing drug discovery might end up having, where if the SAR for all of the desired features doesn't align, that's one of the challenges we faced in chemistry optimization. And this is a glaring case here, we know we fix the herb by putting in a polar group, because we know those are just herbs. But then we took a hit in BBB penetration. So that's a yin yang with some time. I mean, we were hoping that we fix the herg and then that aligns with the CNS penetration. But that, that's not always the case. That's what genius chem is doing, sir. But we always have cases where you have these two antagonizing features where one of them you want to give you penetration, but then you have herg which needs a polar group, and then those two features don't go hand in hand. So. You know, we always try to stick to some optimal compounds. And as I say, I mean, that's why the question is, are we willing to accept a 20% penetration at the cost of getting rid of herd? Or are we willing to accept those herd profile numbers for the cost of highly CNS penetration? So what I started to do is I say, you know, why don't I? I went and I started putting up all the FDA-approved kinases, and I started looking at the herd profile preclinically, and what they have done for those compounds. So a lot of these compounds that had herb, they went, they did dark telemetry, and that didn't hinder them from de development. Some of these are kind of first line to work And so for disease area like the IPG, which have no good treatment, I think her, these herb numbers are well within reason for us to take for development. And so to put that into some context, these are some of the approved drugs, I mean, and the committee when just got approved what last last day. Okay, that's an EGFR in here. That's the herb value for it, and it hits the target at about seven nanomolar. So I wouldn't it's first line therapy for pa first line therapy for patients with um, certain types of lymphoma. Okay, it's given to a lot of patients. The herb value is nine hundred nanomolar. 
you know, vomuracinib, which is used for melanoma and stuff, that was approved. Its her value is 1.24 micromolar in pap scan. You know, vandetanib, sunitinib, which has been out there for ages, is a multi-kinase inhibitor given to a lot of patients. Her value is 217. Nalotinib, lapatinib is 1.1. So those were the patch plant numbers that we had. A lot nib for lung cancer, there's that nib for um, CML and stuff, and then Quizot nib for lung. You know, so you could see, I mean, our numbers are five and eight. Those are reasonable. All those compounds, they went to dark, telemetry to kind of at least get the risk. But I mean, some of these compounds, all at high doses during like the dark telemetry, that they see a little hint of elong prolongation, but that didn't hinder them from development. And so with this type of data, I'm starting to look at the disease we're going after where there is no treatment. The herd values that we have are acceptable herd risks to take for development. So the mitigating experiment is what everybody does. We just go, we do dark telemetry. And the worst case scenario is the FDA can tell you, if we do see prolongation, they must tell you, oh, you might just have to have a warning on the, 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 the drug labeling. So some of these compounds actually just have a warning, but they haven't seen any QT prolongation in the clinic. So if you go to the FDA, some of the, I mean, oh my, my reference is back cut off. Some of this information is from the IND filing from the FDA website, and then there's an actual article from Drug Safety, it's actually a journal. So, and they were discussing a lot of those issues. Point I want to make, I think the CNS penetrant compounds that we have, they have heard of five or eight, I think are very, very strong candidates still for development. If you put, in, put it in context in terms of the risk versus benefit. If ALP2 is beneficial in terms of um, ALP2 mutants in the disease, we have potent compounds that can actually target that mutation. I think the, the herd risk is worth taking. So the key next step would be dark telemetry. And so what I've done, the reason why I actually put, you could see, I have the four compounds here, 2009, 2117, 236, and 24. And I cannot resist but pulling uh, 2160 back into the mix. Because in terms of, that's the compound that active across all of the patient derived lines. And so if her value is too, it's, you know, I anticipate it should be higher than CNS penetration, like 209, but I have a question. We still have to get that data. Okay, but that might be another component to look at. And one way we could think about it is for development, we could decide, okay, let's take these three curved compounds, put them in dark telemetry, and then see which one of them gives you the best in a QT profile in dark telemetry. And you could you have an option to pick. The other option is to take, just pick one and take the risk of going and doing dark telemetry. So those are some of the questions that I wanted to put out there. So I was trying to find uh, 2163, uh, sorry, the previous slides for uh, how it went up against everything else. And, and I can't find it. Do you have it handy? Like, how selective was it? How, you know, and et cetera, down the line. Um, yeah. You know, we've had many conversations about her. Yeah. And, and I, I would... The profile is no different to zero zero nine. The reason why we dropped it is the herd, but because herd was something we were worried about. Was it only her? Yeah. Hog was the only thing we know. We don't have PK for it, so that's the thing. We need to do full PK and BBB and get that data in. But the profile wasn't any different from 2009. Yeah. So, and the only thing we liked about it is because we gave it to Angle. Angle, oh, liked it better because it was more important. Mm. We gave it to now Chris Jones. They said, oh, this one is really, really important. So at one point we were getting excited. This is active across the pretty land. And then because we were doing start to just the herd, we kind of said, you know what? If her girls and she didn't want us to start off with something else, we were more willing to stick to 2009, which is closer to our 10 micromolar benchmark. Can I ask? Sorry, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Is the HERG assay for those compounds on the previous slide the same assay as our data, or are we comparing our data with kind of literature data? So they're all patch clamps. That's they're all patch data. So we did patch, they did patch. Yes. Done by the same company or anything? Or but I don't know company. I don't know which companies like GSK would use for their patch. That data is not available. But a lot of people use Chan, Chan tests. I mean, we use Chan tests. I mean, yeah. I just different services. How much the values would vary? It can vary. Mm. Yeah. Can vary so maybe we want to take one of them and test it in 
Ah, oh, supply, you know, RSA. Can I just make a comment? Yeah. This is Nicole here from Charles River. So having taken quite a few kinase inhibitors through the clinic that have, or through preclinical talks, sorry, that have HERG issues, I, I think your assessment is right, Methvin, and we should move these forward to dog telemetry. But the other data that we don't have yet that will be key is around the exposure that's needed to drive the therapeutic effect versus the exposure that causes the risk with HERG. And, and as we move forward, we'll start to generate that data. But it'll, it, rather than the in vitro IC50, that will be the key data that the FDA will be interested in with what kind of window of safety do you have around the exposure needed to drive benefit versus the point at which these risks kick in. So I think you're making the right decision to progress these forward into those key in vivo safety studies, but those are the data we'll need. It's more around the yeah. and the and the dose. So the, the ultimate dose of the compound will be the key data. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. David, you had a yeah, I was just going to say um, ahead of all that I agree with all these arguments that uh, there's a pretty standard formula that relates to free fraction yes. with the efficacious dose yes. with the protein binding. Yeah. Yes. You can use you can use that to compare safety and I think if you apply those formulas to these, yes. you'll probably find you're in good shape. Yeah. But yes. it would be good to do that. Yes. Yes. I think that'd I mean, be good. I was going to suggest we, that as well. So based on the in vitro cell data that you just shared, that would be a good calculation to make. Yes. Yeah, we just got the um, plasma protein binding data for all of the lead compounds. So yeah, so that's something to do. So the human plasma protein binding data. Yeah. As an action item, are we missing any of the other, um, you know, workup on 2163 that we have for the others? And should we just mandate that we get that done? Yeah, and we then, gotta and get then take it, as you said. We'll keep that. I don't have a personally. I think. It, you know, don't want to go much more than five because then we get this, you know, lose focus. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the whole goal was, you know, we're saying let's get something between three and five. We end yes. up with four. Yes. So five five's fine. I agree with that. You know, my limited knowledge about everything from the HERG size, we're, we're really early. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is, I mean, we're here to solve DIPG yes. and to take out one of the compounds that seems to be the most effective with the models that we have. Yes. Right. Put it back this in. is Al again, my all caveat. I love the biochemical data, the patch plant data. The data that is the least believable is the cell line data, mm -hmm. right? They are weird ass lines that were selected. So don't make them equivalent in your minds, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The data that are biochemically done by a CRO and a very careful science, mm -hmm. you, you can take that to the bank. Lines in different hands where you can change the results if you change the density of the cells even mm -hmm. and do it in England and do it in you'll get just be cautious right mm -hmm. they're not equivalent but I'll just I know mean, we beat this one like, several times but you know the, the nice thing that we're doing is trying to get the same people to do the, the, the same experiments and we're tr you know trying to get those people to do this you know, on the same cell lines, I the same compounds. But you just, think you're measuring? No, just, it's a comparative. It's a yeah, it's all the comparative, and, and that's all we're trying to do is get it's a rank. It's a feel-good experiment. It's a rank. It's a feel-good experiment because what it does is you don't know that the ALK2 dependency of a cell line is the same as it is in the tissue because you've selected that cell to grow for who the fuck knows how excuse me how many reasons. So I agree with you. It's the best we can do. But just when you're ranking data on how strong I'm going to incorporate into my humongous calculus of efficacy and PK and talks and her, that's the least, mm -hmm. that's the least um, take it home to the bank data. All the other data are very strong. Okay. So Al, Al, moving forward then, which data can we use to start making human dose predictions if we can't use those cell data? I, I, I think the... Uh, Personally, the FOP model, where you see a physiological effect uh, of bone growth, it, it won't tell you about brain efficacy, unfortunately, but in that model, it's genetically predisposed to the ex and the phenotype is exactly what the children get. Um, you get abnormal bone growth upon injury and the compound hitting the exact same target using the exact same signaling mechanism, presumably because the mutations are identical, confers a physiological effect. And I would say that the concentration of a compound swimming around um, is, is prop that, to my mind, that's the most comforting data. With humongous caveats as well, but if I was to rank the biological believability, that would be the top. 
and then cell line second, and then the DIPG animal model a long way third. So when I was referring to that formula, I was referring to in vivo efficacy and uh, you know the, the FOP. You know that's as good as any, I guess. But uh, we, I think so. We just have to do the conversion going across the blood-brain yeah. barrier, which we can do pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay, so moving on, we we'll got to some of the next steps you're looking for. So we're hoping in the next month or two we'll get start getting a hint of activity for um, 2009 in the angle orthotopic model. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Jones will say he's going to start the Belcher model. Um, we started scaling up the lead candidates. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, we started scaling up the additional lead candidates to 50 grams to afford additional studies or pick and other stuff down the line. Um, we still need to do some toler. We did dose escalation. We still need to do some tolerability assessment, both in mice and rat. That is just do multiple dosing, a couple of days. And so I think one of the things we always want is to be able to go up to 300 mix per kick in one of these species, just to get comfortable. Um, we had discussed a couple of times, you know, with some of the questions we were just discussing about, you know, how do we end up trying to predict human dose. I mean, one thing we can try and do is to do a PD model that correlates at least your dose to like a PK study and there's a marker with that we can check for R2. So maybe when we start getting efficacy in some of these models, depending on what that plasma concentration is, you know, we can gain some of those by using PD markers for efficacy. So that's a study we wanted to kind of evaluate. We're trying to get some quotes from CRL to do that study and then we're planning to evaluate 209 first and if 209 looks good then we just run the back of all of the dashboard candidates that we have. And so that's a good PD marker for like, you know, for out to biology or out to out to biology, whatever you want. Okay, and so with regards to timeline, we got to see the timeline in terms of when the grant runs out, but like I'll say, you know, we're going to probably try and get funds to do a lot of the more expensive dark telemetry studies later on. So, you know, oh, and it has to find some cash to do that. But all in all, I think we're kind of on track. Things are looking good. So we're just waiting for some in vivo efficacy data. One of the things we might want to discuss is how much you act up. Like you say, you always wanted some rat data. Whether just the tolerability at 300 mix per kg is good enough right now for that top, so I want to probably get enough material to do some non-GLP type of evaluation, doing more necrosis and more organ evaluation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those are some of the, I have them close to the end of the timeline, those can easily be pushed over mm -hmm. after the declaration yeah, of the candidate. They're not requirements for, for, for the funding that we have, yeah. you know, the, the yeah. milestones we have in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it all depends on the cost. There are some other, I think, more interesting studies that you just put up there that yeah. we'd like to do. Yes. I'd like to see the, the tur I'd like to explore the turbantine model just yes. to get, again, the ranking, gain another peak at, at yeah. 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 the efficacy. So apologies on that. I, I meant to chase that up before the meeting, but I haven't. I, I forgot to chase that up. Um, I will get back to you as soon as possible on that quote. Yeah, yeah. We just need to Thank get you. an idea yeah. first, yeah. All right. Okay, so that's basically with regard to kind of some of the updates and again some interesting discussions in terms of strategy. So one question on this on this slide, you've still got uh, the sort of DIPG proof of concept efficacy study on that slide, but you mm -hmm. you were just uh, you were just I was just saying about um, doing the FOP model, but are we, are we going to be able to get enough compound of of the various different compounds through uh, one of these models? So we're scaling them right now up to 50, we're getting 50 grams of all of them made, just like we did for 2009. So for all of the dog PK and any FOP, any in vivo model that we want to do, I think we'll have enough compounds. If we consider 216, 2163, that's the other candidate, that one we have naturally done PK, we might need to scale that one up eventually too. So, yeah, but we're hoping to have 50 grams. I was actually thinking more of actually getting the. You, I mean, I was just saying about the, the FOP model. Um, we've only had two doses in the FOP model, and I know it, it's not a simple model, but are we going to be able to get sort of multiple compounds through multiple doses to understand the 
uh, the dose that's required to, you know, the, short answer, the, the lowest dose that we need to actually get some efficacy? The short answer is no. Um, the University of Pennsylvania doesn't have the throughput to, to get this done. Uh, at this time, hence the interest in trying to do the turpentine model okay. um, as a proxy. Yeah. Um, Charles River apparently has the model. It's a GoPin Montreal that runs it, but it's over hundred, close to hundred thousand dollars per compound to get this study done. So you got to cough up a lot more money. Yeah. So so the, the view would be to uh, get that money in place for so we can work with you um, after November. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and so I mean, yeah, that's something we have discussed. That like, we thought we could, and you know, again, it's going to come up over and over again. I mean, initially we thought we could use the FOP as the driver going forward. We made an effort. We met with a bunch of clinicians who actually drive a lot of these. What do you call them? These DIPG. What do you call them? Consortium. Consortiums, yeah. And we tried to push it, and they were pushing back. They insist, no, you cannot use FOP as a model. And they're going to kind of start raising the bar. Everybody was saying in the past, compounds were getting into the clinic for DIPG. The, some of the people were running these consortiums for, with the recruit patients. They insist that they're going to stop just taking any and anything. You know what I mean? They want to see efficacy in some DIPG, as irrelevant as it might seem, they want to see some efficacy in a DIPG model. So, I mean, you know, we thought we could have gotten away with it, and it's something to deal with them and the regulatory agency. These are the consortium that recruit patients, and so the, one of the physicians was saying, the onus is on us, you know, the patients are in their care, and they're not going to just give them any and any toxic compounds for people. They need DIPG. So, it's a big debate. You know what I mean? But again, it's the regulatory agency and some of these groups that are actually running trials. They get patients. And so it's something you got to think about. I mean, but again, FOP is still also a viable option. I mean, whether they decide to want to use the compound in the IPG, if you get the FOP efficacy model, that's still a disease area of value. So, I mean, you know, it's a win win situation. Okay? Um, so let's move on. Okay, who's next? Oh, Jean Fouiza. Um, let's pull up. Jean Fouiza. All right. Thanks, Mr. Ben. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Jean Fouiza. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm showing here are two of the compounds from Charles Rivers lab um, that have been tested recently. Um, they are decently potent, but I, I haven't been able to get the uh, out five uh, activity um, yet, though. But I'll, I'll be getting that soon and updating uh, you both. And these are having the um, basically the group from the blueprint early okay. feature. Kind of no, the, no these, these were um, analogs of the pyridine series, but, <laughs> so the bit on the left hand side is a modification for the uh, replacement for the trimethoxyphenyl. Try and mm -hmm. find some sensible uh, alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the one on the right is probably the best in that series that we've seen, hasn't yeah. it, in terms of potency? It, it is actually. I mean, on my slides, I, the, the one issue that we've got with these, with these compounds is we're not seeing um, particularly good out 5 or out 4 selectivity. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, which is a bit of a shame, but so the uh, cell-based out five would be really interesting to see whether you know that's backed up in in the cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would be absolutely be important because as I say the selectivity usually get a lot or a little bit worse in, in the cells, so it'd be important to see if it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when is you're that doing the assays, Um, like Friday, so by Friday. Okay. Yeah. We'll, 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 maybe, we'll, we'll, maybe we can forward on these data for out five in a in a week. In, yeah, in, in a few days. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next slide. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> part of the study was uh, to look at the possibility of uh, combining M4K uh, compound with uh, other um, inhibitors, and in this case, um, it has been known that. Um, epigenetic inhibitors that target um, either ECHU, which is responsible for the 
uh, methylation of the uh, lysine 27 of histone 3 or um, the demethylase. So um, these inhibitors have been previously shown in um, other publications to uh, be having some, some ex to some extent, be having as efficacy towards uh, the IPG cells. And, and this uh, was because the, uh, the DIPG cells having the uh, H3K27M mutation is sensitive, uh, is sensitized to the dose inhibition. So uh, I wanted to double check whether um, I see uh, any sort of synergy with those compounds. So we can move on to next slide. So I've uh, checked several uh, ESX2 uh, metal transferase inhibitors. So uh, and also. Um, the inhibitor for the demethylase that is uh, removing the methylation at uh, H3K27. Um, unfortunately, I do not see any like strong uh, synergy, uh, synergistic effect uh, of those inhibitors with uh, 2009. And yeah, as indicated by all the um, scores in, in, in red. In, and we can move on to the Next slide. And um, through the kinase sc um, screen, we have identified several off-targeted uh, kinases by uh, 2009. And I've also tested um, some of them that um, we are already having the inhib inhibitor of to see whether further inhibition of those off-target uh, would have any effect. And, and actually, for all these experiments, I've chosen um, Two line that is relatively less responsive to the um, uh, M4K compounds, um, double O seven, which is having the two O six H mutation, and um, number four, which is having the G three two eight V mutation. And again, in this case, um, I do not see very um, any strong uh, synergy uh, synergistic effect. In fact, um, they are mostly antagonistic. Yeah. What does the number at the bottom mean, like when it's 93 or minus 45? Um, that's um, overall when we um, take in consideration all the different matrix, like of the con uh -huh. concentration. But would 100 be the maximum? What's the scale? What, how does it work? Um, it's, it's just a relative amount, though. Okay. It's, it's not like a, there's, there's no maximum scale, per se. Next slide. Yeah, yeah. And the other e um, effect um, we saw that um, was that the um, blue pin series, for example, the M4K 3078, um, it was potent, it was very potent in selected um, the IPG cell line, but not so much with the rest. Mm -hmm. And to pot potentially address this. Uh, discre discrepancy in potent, uh, in the efficacy. I try to uh, check whether in if in, used in combination with the inhibitor for the um, off targets of 2009, for example, for like DDR1 and TNIC, which are off targeted by 2009, whether I would be able to imp improve the uh, efficacy of um, the blueprint series, the 3078, uh, which is so chosen uh, as an example. And yeah, um, and next, next one. yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay. And again, in this case, um, I did not find strong um, synergistic effect. Like one of the inhibitors did slightly improve the efficacy, but um, not 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 to a very strong extent. And uh, for TNIC, uh, the inhibition um, actually is antagonistic to the um, M4K 2078. And this actually is seen both in uh, 2009 as well as uh, 3078, indicating that the off target on TNIC is probably partially um, countering the efficacy of the, our M4K compounds. So, yeah. We can move on to the and the other um, compound that I've tested in combination 
was one uh, was the one target that is off target by um, a legacy compound um, LDN one um, and um, in combination with that, I, I again did not see uh, any synergy. In fact, um, it seems to be antagonizing the M4K 3078. So, um, yeah, we can move on to the next slide. Okay. So, in, in conclusion, I did not find um, any combination that produced synergy. Mm -hmm. Aside from uh, GSK 343 to a like, very less. Uh, to a very small extent. Just to this out, I have a question. Yeah. What's the positive control for these kinds of experiments where one sees in quotation marks synergy in the clinic and synergy described uh, presumably by the, the molecules work at lower concentrations together than they do combined or something like that? I mean, I can imagine there's not many examples of of this happening in the real world um, by synergy. I mean, I can see two different mechanisms of killing where one then the other. But what's the what's the positive control? I mean, how do we know what we're looking for and whether a cell based cell killing assay can find synergy in quotation marks? That was done with. So I know from lymphoma studies. Yeah, I put names. I put nibble at it in the background of like dexamethasone and uh, what's the antibody that's used in lymphoma? Uh, the CD33. Yeah, what's the name of it? Anyway, there's a standard of care antibody. Yeah. A lot of the, a lot of the preclinical data for synergy did support um, a clinical study. Yeah. That got the approval for those. So I mean, the examples of it. You know, and how did they design that? Just exactly like that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one. I could give you more. Okay. There, there's more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The people are doing it. All. People have now come to acknowledge that cancer therapy is going to be multiple. So whenever there's potential well, opportunity. I understand the theory. Yeah. It's yeah. just the practice I was interested in. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and for the regulatory agency, you've got to give them evidence that you anticipate some meaningful outcome. So some of that preclinical data help make your case for regulatory agencies. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as you can imagine, actually demonstrating synergy in the clinic is very, very difficult. Yes. I mean, it's hard enough just to show efficacy. <laughs> but if you have a powerful rationale preclinically like this, then you know you have a rationale going to the clinic like BRAP MAC, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've had synergy here in uh, clinical trials with PD one and PDL one antibodies. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously, you get more toxicity as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, this is a, it's worth doing because, like I was saying, I think the FDA is going to demand combo. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm excited about some of the data where we can, when Jerome finishes his data set, more and more I'm kind of getting more with it. If you get a CNS penetrant age desk in here with it, I want to believe that that might be a, an angle to get some synergy. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm excited about his data set because the last set he ran, we gave him a CNS penetrant HDAC inhibitor that's very well tolerated. A lot of the HDAC inhibitors are either non penetrant and are very, very toxic. This one is CNS penetrant and it's very well tolerated and you can dose it very high. Mm -hmm. And it's actually in phase two or phase three clinic. Methyl, it started at Methyl Gene. They're a company actually called Forum. They have it in the clinic. They're going after patients with dementia and I think HDAC what? Yeah? There's 11 H DACs. Which time yeah, it hits one and one two. two. One and two. Yeah, yeah. And so they're looking at patients, I think, with dementia and uh, dementia. frontal lobe dementia and stuff. And so for the level of tolerance and the exposure that they get in the brain, if we see nice synergy, we already have some evidence that one of the CNS penetrant H DAC is showing some degree of synergy in our experiment. Okay. So if we see if it's another H DAC in here, which is okay, it's going to boost confidence that this might be something to look at. All right? So, okay, thank you, Alex and Young Fu. That's nice. I mean, it's a worthwhile set of studies to do. If you can make a case on frame, an ideal combination, that would be key. Okay, so, so you're up. If nobody has questions for Young Fu. Just introduced Alison Howard, who's just joined the group. Pam? Want to say really well. Hi everyone. Yeah, I just uh, joined Alex's group as a research assistant, so I'll be joining the project with Jong Fu. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, it's fantastic. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay, so you're up. Okay, so if you move on the slide, please. Okay, so just uh, gen the usual sort of start off general update. So there were over the over the last um, couple of months, there's been 13 compounds from the CRL group submitted. So six of these were from that benzimidazole series that Jung Fu was just talking about, and, and the hope was that this last set would uh, provide some clarification on whether there was any progress, any, any anything further that we could do with that. Um, we've also, uh, four of the compounds were within the blueprint series, and we've also submitted uh, two Protax for screening to complement the initial Protax compound that uh, the OICR made. We've also got the two results on the PK on two of the blueprint compounds, and we're obviously developing more ideas around the blueprint scaffold and to extend the Protax approach. So that's just a general summary. Should we move on to the next slide, please? So this was a summary of these um, these benzimidazole type compounds. So you can see that uh, 3100 that uh, Xiong Fu was just talking about was very potent in um, on ALK2. Um, but unfortunately, ALK4 um, is only about 38 nanomolar, and ALK5 is 130 nanomolar. So generally for this series, we see um, very poor selectivity over the other ALKs. And this might be something that we can come back and revisit, um, but at the moment it's not looking terribly promising. We can get good potency. We can clearly, from what Jung Fu was just saying, get quite good um, cell activity, but I think we would need to look at how to improve the, um, the selectivity over the other ALKs. So at the moment we're sort of putting this to one side, uh, mm -hmm. so that we can so that we can focus on the uh, Blueprint series. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Next slide, please. So, again, this is just my introductory slide. The, the Blueprint series, um, clearly 3007 was the first compound that we made from, from the Blueprint patent. So it has good ALK2 potency. It has pretty reasonable selectivity over ALK4 and ALK5. Um, but unfortunately, we, when we did the CACO2, we saw some efflux, and this was borne out when we put it into a PK study and found we had quite poor brain penetration. Um, so we looked at the physchem properties. It's got quite a high molecular weight, um, and the PKA, uh, calculated PKA comes out around 9.6, um, but it's depends on which package you use, whether it considers that the piperidine nitrogen on the right-hand side is the more basic, or the piperazine nitrogen on the left-hand side, on the top ring, is the more basic. Um, so some of our early targets were trying to address that, um, just trying to generally get an improvement in the FISCHEM properties, with, where possible, lowering the molecular weight um, and trying to reduce the PKA. Next slide, please. So this compound, uh, M4K2256, is what is believed to be BLU782, which is a compound um, in the clinic for uh, FOP. This was the structure that uh, was made, uh, or I think it was, you, you got it made externally, Methvin, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this compound, um, actually probably has a pretty similar profile to 3007 from a, a PK perspective. And again, as expect, as we saw with 3007, <coughs> it's got a, a low brain to plasma ratio. Um, and as I say, the, the, it's, again, it's got high molecular weight, it's well over 500, and the PKA is very similar to that in um, M4K 3007. Uh, so I guess the profile was probably not unexpected, but it's probably a good compound for uh, FOP. Next slide, please. So then we looked at two of the more recent compounds that we made where the, the two compounds, so 3078, 
we've modulated the pKa of the piperidine nitrogen by putting an octetane on it. Um, the the, uh, the in the CACO2 that uh, reduced the um, efflux that we saw with the 2007. Unfortunately, in the PK, you can see that the plot is on the left-hand side, and in in the uh, table underneath, the brain to plasma ratio of 0.07. It's actually gone in the wrong direction. So just thinking about it, probably the molecular weight is also uh, having an impact here. Uh, 3079 um, has a similar in vitro profile, um, changing the ethoxy piperidine to a piperazine. Um, we actually see, we still see quite good oral bioavailability and a slight improvement in the brain to plasma ratio. It's probably still lower than we'd, we'd ideally like to, to be. Um, so maybe we, we need to not only reduce the molecular weight but also reduce the pKa further. Let's move on to the next slide. So these are some of the new compounds uh, in this series 1395. And 3101 are uh, different cores, so the, these two have both got a bidentate hinge interaction. Uh, they both, well, 3095 shows a reasonable, um, reasonable potency, and uh, all of the compounds show good selectivity. Um, 30, 1393 at the end, which has the uh, fluorine on the core, we were a little concerned that this might have reduced the uh, electron negativity around the hinge nitrogen too far. But actually, that still has retained potency. And when you do the pKa calculations for the nitrogens there, they drop the pKa highest pKa drops down to about 8.1. So this could be uh, an interesting compound to follow up further so, to find out whether it does have an improved brain to plasma. Uh, can't say that brain to plasma ratio. <laughs> so I don't know what you what you think about that. Yeah, yeah, it's not a bad compound. Mm -hmm. Okay. So moving on, uh, so a couple of other compounds. We were thinking that we could ch again change the pKa on the piperazine nitrogen um, by, well, the compound on the right hand side, 3098, actually removes it. Um, but you, sh you should still retain sufficient, um, hopefully, interaction between the uh, pyridazine nitrogen and the hinge. But unfortunately, 3098 was completely inactive, which was rather disappointing. Uh, so it clearly seems like we need to have a nitrogen in that position to get the activity, because we had a carbon before, we've now got an oxygen. Mm -hmm. It may be that it doesn't put the carbon off in quite the right place, but all the docking work that Sylvia did did suggest that it was that you would still get the uh, the interaction. So it was a little bit disappointing that one. Um, mm -hmm. But we move on. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So, just thinking about where we want to take this uh, series now, we're going to do. Sylvia's been on holiday; she's back today, so we're going to do. Going to start docking some more compounds, but here's some of the initial areas. So, so 1393, as I mentioned, with a fluorine on the core, looks to be quite a nice compound. So, we want to look at some additional um, substituents there to see what is tolerated what effect we can have on the nitrogen, uh, on, on the hinge nitrogen. So there's a few ideas there. It's also looking at, um, it's so based on both the carbon and the oxygen link for that ring, it looks like we probably need to have uh, a nitrogen there. So um, there's a few things where we're replacing the piperazine by uh, an amino pyrrolidine or an amino piperidine. So some of these have been docked already, and we still see uh, reasonable interactions in the lysine uh, region. And also, so um, we've received a batch of the BOC intermediate at the bottom, which is the intermediate uh, for the prep of the compound that we think is BLU782. Um, so we can look at some other uh, approaches to reducing the basicity of that uh, perazine nitrogen. However, these compounds are all going to have quite high molecular weight, so I have a feeling, I would think it's worth having a look at a couple of compounds, but I have a feeling that these are going to 
has a similar um, brain to plasma issue as we've seen with um, the compound we, we've looked at already in PK. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. I mean, sorry. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we've got. So this is the uh, the other blueprint patent, which again we've uh, done docking, and we've seen that uh, we we've got quite much, uh, that they dock quite nicely. So this is more recent blueprint patent, and we're in the process of making three of the compounds selected from that first first analog, uh, which I think is compound thirty is. We're just waiting for the analysis on that. Um, the other two are approaching completion. Mm -hmm. okay. next, slide, the next one is about Protax. So these are the two compounds that we have made here. So they've got different um, peg linkers, different linkers into 2000 and in, into the, the core structure, and we've got two different um, uh, ligands at the end. Uh, both compounds show good potency. Um, they also have retained the good selectivity over the other ALKs, even in this bio. This is just the biochemical data. So I guess the next step it really is to look at uh, the ALK2 degradation. So I think well, I think it was um, that was done in in your group, Alex, previously with the previous compound. Is that right? That's right. It'll be exciting to test these as well. Also so we'll in the yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm currently performing some uh, immunoprecipitation to verify whether or not um, addition of the 2241, the, the previous version, um, yeah. whether it induces yeah. ubiquitination of the out 2 right. But mm -hmm. in, in comparison, the previous one was less potent, though. Uh, back then, mm -hmm. it was over 2000. Um, nanomolar uh, ICCT uh, on up to. These are much nicer things. Yeah. But those are, those are the biochemical, the, the cellular activity was uh, weaker. You got biochemical um, cellular activity for these already? No, we, no. Basically, we only sent them for the biochemical activity because we weren't quite sure what, what we were going to do to follow up. So I haven't sent any to, um, to uh, Jung Fu yet. Okay, so we were, because we were getting very similar numbers. The biochemical numbers for us was like 15 and more of as to, but we saw a shift when we went to the cellular yeah. assay, which I is think, not surprising sometimes with some of these. So I think that, that one of the things that I was talking with uh, the guys, uh, uh, our local uh, people who've done quite a lot of work around this sort of area, you, you need to look at quite a range of different uh, linkers, peg lengths, mm -hmm. different... Yeah. Um, like ligands. So we have a plan which is thematically put at the bottom, but I think I sent you a little bit more detail, uh, uh, Methin. Um, yeah. So there are some of the compounds that, so these compounds have got quite a few H bond donors, um, yes. and I think the compound that you made also had quite a few H bond donors, and that can really hit your cell penetration. It may, exactly. may just purely be down to cell penetration that yeah. you, you're seeing weaker cell activity. But some of the compounds that we're proposing now um, will, ha will have less H bond donors. So I think yes. it would be good to get a, a, a set of compounds so that we can test a whole range of them and see how see where we go with them. Yeah, definitely. That should be the approach. A lot of it sometimes is unpredictable. We've got to get them all post of them and then test them to see which one actually gives you the cellular phenotype they're looking for. There is, so, a known, there is a known small molecule in the literature which degrades the type 2 TGF-beta receptor inhibitor, uh, TGF -beta receptor. It's not a protac, it's just a small molecule that seems to bind and cause degradation by some unknown mechanism, but um, that's something we could look up, uh, maybe analyze here to see um, how that might work. So okay. no definite clues for now or for out two, but um, at least you know degradation in theory is possible for these receptors. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks. Interesting. And it, it's also known that you can get brain, pen, you can get cell and brain penetrant um, uh, protax. Yeah. 
Okay. There's yeah. literature out there to suggest that you can get compounds that will pen that are brain penetrant. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll okay. we'll send you a sample of these to uh, Alex. Jennifer. Okay. And I think um, Julian was going to have to go off and look at some of that today. For more yeah. uh, discussion. So, yeah. So there's when a. Uh, yeah, it's holiday time at the moment, yeah. so it won't be until next month. Okay. All right. Good. Any questions for Sue? If not. Okay, thanks, Sue. That's good. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah, so that's it for presentations in terms of updates for today. Um, if there's any other burning issues that people want to discuss, I mean, started some of it already in terms of strategy, next step. Um, so the floor is open. If people have anything, any questions, any clarity that people desire on certain things. What do we expect to have at the next meeting from new data? Yeah. So the combination study is from um, Jerome. Yep. Um, Diana is going to go over her assay and give us a lot more of the data update for that one. Mm -hmm. And I think no, right now all we're waiting for is some efficacy. Yep. And and some of the scale ups. So I need to get the scale up for uh, Chemtech uh, with, for 2163 going. Yeah. Okay, maybe you could probably touch base with Angel one of these days and ask him. Yeah, I, I, was, I was tempted to email him and ask him what's going on, but don't want to add too much pressure too early. Ah. <laughs> I'm back from vacation. I'm rested. I can. I should yeah, reach yeah. out to everyone. Plus, I you know, I'm sensitive to the fact that in the summer they kick off. So I have yeah. to give them another read. Read a little bit more profiling on 2163. Yes, we yeah. should do that. Yeah, the 2163 profiling. At this point, though, because of time's running out, we should probably just go ahead and scale up 2163 as well. Yeah, we because that. otherwise we're just going to run out of time. Yes, yeah, we'll take that risk. So yeah, so we so we should do the PK mm -hmm. for 2163 PKBBB. Um, I don't know, should we add the the blueprint compound from her? The one two compounds? How many compounds should we test for the Oh uh, you I, I think uh yeah, I think we should we should take a look at some of the uh, Charles River compounds. Yeah, yeah but she just highlighted one. Yeah. So maybe we just add it to this one and oh, do two, just do two. Okay. You hear that too? Yes. So how much do you need for that? If we're gonna do PK and BBB we need probably about you have about over twenty mix? Okay, I'll have to see what we've got and um, so for, the fluoro, for the fluoro compound. Yeah, I mean, if it's available immediately, then I'll wait and then I think we have enough 2163. I think we might, yeah. yeah. If we have enough 2163, then I'll probably wait if you have enough of that other compound and then make a request for quotes for two compounds. If you have to resynthesize, you might just go with 2163 and wait until they're finished. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll yeah. just need to check stock levels. I think, knowing who, who made that, I'm fairly sure that we will have had enough, but I'll, I just need to check the database. Yeah, yeah, do that. So, yeah, we'll get PKBBB yeah. for those two compounds. Um, the other thing that came up, actually, I mean, I know it was being lingering, and then Alec kind of flagged it the other day. Syrup. Syrup screen. Mm -hmm. Now, because we're going into the break, and then you're going to get whopping con concentrations of these. I mean, we have another pro We just got some syrup data from another program, too, that's available at Eurofint. We don't know. It's important to understand now we're in the brain. Are we hitting any of the brain targets that are liable? And so, you know, the syrup screen, they're about $5,000 per compound. Um, Eurofint have a, what they call a safety 44 panel. That involves you know some selected serotonin, muscarine, acetylcholine. They have a nice little panel of you know um, safety 44. Whether or not we want to start getting a feel for some of the CNS targets that we might potentially be hitting, are we actually clean in CNS targets? And so whether that's something we do now for the lead compounds, mm -hmm. or do we pick one and get a flavour of what that profile is going to look like? Okay. Um, but, but give that some thought. I mean, there's a cost associated with it. So either you want to do it up front or you want to wait and 
you know, learn about that risk later. Well, you and I need to, to uh, book another uh, budgeting kind of yes. planning meeting. So let's let's get that in for either end yeah. of this week or early next week, and then we'll yeah. throw it yeah. Okay, fantastic. Sounds good. Okay, I want to... Because who knows, you may throw another compound up here. And? Oh. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so other than that, I mean, the other burning issues, some of the things that are waiting in the wings, like I was saying, some of the key just mechanical stuff, um, you know, for clinical developments, dog PK, right? but those, as I say, those are all costs, so whether we want to delay some of that, get some of the more, more important, you know, decision-making data now, and then when some of the dog PK stuff later, or maybe some of the dog PK might also be decision-making, so those are some of the things we have to kind of juggle around and discuss in what order we want and this stuff. Okay. All right. If not, thanks everyone. Thank you okay, everyone. I look forward to updates from next month. Hope everyone can enjoy the, the last of the summer. We'll see you uh, after Labor Day. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.